Welcome to the Balanced Ambition Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Southam. Here, we delve into candid conversations with entrepreneurs, exploring both their business journey and their secrets to maintaining mental well-being. As we navigate the balance of ambition and inner peace, I hope you find insights, inspiration and invaluable takeaways in every episode. Thank you for joining us. Richard, welcome to the podcast. You've described yourself as curious. So how has that influenced and, and affected your business journey from when you first started out? I think when you start in any business, you need to, to be successful. You ideally need to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you're doing it just for financial sake. And many people who, I don't know, gone into the city, then end up, you know, leaving after a period of time and doing something else which they enjoy. Um, and I'm curious about sports, art, social purpose, all sorts of things. They tend to be passion points, which they are, but maybe just one or two for most people. But I'm curious and passionate about a lot of things. And I'm interested to learn more. So when some unusual project comes across my desk, I think, hmm, is that interesting? Can I help them? And I quite like and enjoy diving into it. Yeah. So so explain a little bit about what you what you currently do now and then maybe jump back into how you got into the industry. We're working for a range of different people now. Um, for example, we're, we're working on a new um, photographic awards uh, which will be announced shortly, or the sponsor of them, but I can't say who it is right at this moment, but very shortly next month they'll be announced. A major mobile phone manufacturer. We're working on a glo- we're working for a global exhibition company advising them on how to maximize their revenue. We've recently worked for a Middle East airline as to which of two premiership football teams they should sponsor. So it's a wide, wide range of, 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 of different clients. Yeah, so, so you, you link up, don't you, between companies wanting to sponsor something and the, the, the business which will, will benefit from having that, I guess, financial sponsorship come into them. Is that, that correct? Yes. I mean, what you tend to find is that companies are sort of potential. Well, sponsorships now are 77 US do- billion US dollar industry. It's huge. Yeah. When I first started in the 80s, um, I was one of the first people in the area and I sort of stumbled into it, to be honest. Um, I, I didn't know what, to, like many people didn't know what I wanted to do after I left university, did two or three different things. I, what I did decide is I wanted to do something creative, inverted commas. Yeah. You know, I'm not an artist, I'm not a musician. I love those things, but that's not my skill set. So I ended up working for a book publishing company. Um, and yeah, it was all very well, but I was buying paper and boards. So that wasn't exactly very creative. Um, and I'm not even quite sure how it happened, but I ended up becoming marketing manager of a major paperback book publishing company. Then from there got into PR and um, PR was quite good for a couple of years, but you know, at the end of the day, I felt uh, for me at that time, it was fairly repetitive, you know, all about, you know, Children, lots of money, market research, you know, these days it's Big Brother and you know certain things that are going to get yeah. PR, which is okay for a while, but after a couple of years, it's not exactly mind-stretching. Um, and one day, somebody I knew was in the sales promotion industry, so we've got this client who's interested in sponsorship. And do you know anything about it? And I said, no. Um, <laughs> they said, well... Are you willing to try and research it and look into it? You know, but we we need some help. So that was my game change moment because I said yes. So mm. I did some research uh, for the brand, came up with a couple of ideas, and then um, they went to them, and then they decided to put the money behind a different brand and not do anything. And I thought, oh, oh well, never mind. Um, and then about six weeks later, because my background was in PR. I sat down with the um, promotions manager of a national newspaper. And, you know, you're chatting away and that. And it's over a lunch, which in those days in Fleet Street, which, those lunches were very long. Yeah. Um, and I said, oh, you know, it's a shame this didn't happen. He said, oh, I'm interested in that. He said, I'll tell you what, it was a, it was a, a national first ever national pool championship. 
Um, okay. Because yeah. the brand previously that had come to me was American. So I thought America, Paul, Snooker was very big at the time. So he said, I'll tell you what, we'll publicise it, we'll get you entries. Oh, no, no, no. I thought, ah, okay. So I thought, you, got, you grab the opportunity when it arises. Yeah. So I said, okay. I didn't have any prize money. So I had to go out and I managed to get um, uh, the company to put up the prizes and put their name. But because I could guarantee them a lot of media coverage in the newspaper, that wasn't too difficult. No. I then went to television, knowing nothing about television at all, but you know, you do, you do what you think's right at the time. And I approached BBC and ITV and various things. There weren't many, there weren't the same number of channels those days. No. There were only about three or four. Um, and um, three weeks before the final, ITV came back to me and said, you know that pool championship, yeah? Um, we'd like to put it live on World of Sport. I thought, what have I let myself in for here? <laughs> I had never, ever done anything like it in my life. So I thought, well, you've got to go for it. You don't get a chance like this. Um, look, in retrospect, it wasn't very good. I mean, no, the event was all right, but the dressing and the way it looked and that. Because I'd already got a venue, I'd pay for it, I had a striped carpet. You think about snooker, it's a plain carpet. And it yeah. should be a plain carpet, for obvious. But, you know, I hadn't got, nobody would put any more money in, including the title sponsor. So I went with it, but it worked well enough. I had, I don't know, 45 minutes network TV on a Saturday afternoon, which is pretty good. And yeah. they wanted to repeat it. So um, next year, and then I did a whole series of other sponsorships. To start with, it was all sport, um, but then it started to go into other areas. Um, so I, I won a tender, for example, from the Department of Trade and Industry um, to, to manage the sponsorship for the UK Pavilion at Expo 92 in Seville. Um, and because there weren't that many people in those days. No. You know, there weren't that many people doing sponsorship. So who do you go to? And it sort of went from there. So th this all kicked off, really, by you saying yes. So that, that goes back to sort of being slightly curious as well, doesn't it? You know, you're sort of, oh, OK, that, that sounds interesting. And and saying yes. It, it It is. And it's also, if you get an opportunity, deciding whether to seize on it. Sometimes you've just got to... Even though you you want to be as professional as you can within your own abilities uh, yep. and your own budgets, um, and then learn from those experiences. So when I did my first pool event, I could see on screen what wasn't right with it. It was yeah. obvious. So okay, next time we need to do this, 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 and this. Learning and you know as you do it, and you know the whole sponsorship industry. You know, started with John Player Special in the late 60s and Formula One. Not a lot happened in the 70s. And then in the start of 80s, it started to grow. Um, and many sporting events said, oh, well, let's go and get a sponsor. And at that time, it was just branding around the football stadium or the athletics or whatever. Yeah. Um, and not much more. And for some people, that's still the case. But that's not what the sponsorship is, industry is today. So... One of the, the first major, well, yeah, the first major event I did was the European Volleyball Championship in Birmingham. And we got the sponsor for that. And then we did ice hockey and we did international athletics and a range of things. And yeah, then after I... that, sorry. No, no, go on, go on, keep, keep going. And that, so initially it was all sport. And then we, we did some work for the Arts Council and helped them set up. Um, we did a, a, a visual art strategy and we also did a strategy around um, uh, diversity and stuff. So it, it, it really spread. And what I like is sometimes, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, sometimes you think, what on earth can I do for this organisation and do it appropriately? Mm. A really, I think one of the more interesting examples is we were approached by the Registrar of Births, Marriages and Deaths. To, to look at, you know, they had a funding shortfall. Doesn't that sound familiar? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, can we do anything? So we immediately said, we all agreed, we're not touching deaths <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> but what we did do is we spent some time and, and they had some research that showed, this is back in, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago, that a large number of people went to get married in registry offices, but either had forgotten their camera hadn't got any film or, you know, so 
and people wanted to take photographs of the wedding. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So we ended up doing a partnership with a film company because it was appropriate and added yeah. value to the people who came, went to the registry office experience and to the guests. So that sort of sponsorship, I think, you know, is very, very relevant. And, and I think that's key about sponsorship, that it should ideally enhance uh, the spectator, the player, the manager, whatever experience. If it does that, then people, you know, really think of it as being a, it's not a badging exercise, it's a meaningful exercise. Yeah, so do you see... So for is it a partnership? Do you sort of see sponsorship sometimes as more of a, a, a partnership rather than necessarily just a, like you say, a commercial enterprise? We've given you some money and we can stick a badge on it. Do you, do, do, does the. Oh, it's got to be a partnership. Absolutely. You've got to work together because a good sponsorship is a strategic decision by a company and they mm. should want to do it for a number of years. And if you've not got a good relationship or people are thinking that you're not handling them right, they won't, won't want your, a good relationship. And you've got to work together. It's mutual aims. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you can't, as an example, pe many people in the arts industry in the early days, and to a degree still today, were concerned about, you know, commercial interference. Well, yeah. you can't have it. You know, if you've got a piece of art, you've got a piece of art. You either have to sponsor it or don't sponsor it. But you can't interfere with the artistic director or the process. It's completely wrong. Yeah. Utterly wrong. Yeah. But I, I was going to touch on earlier, and I think it's quite interesting, um, about sponsors adding to the um, to the uh, spectator experience. I've always remembered a case study I heard that was a major golf event in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, this was a oh, long time ago. And they did the research. Now, Phoenix, Arizona, golf tournament, you're talking about something in the region of about, I don't know, 35 degree heat. So very hot. Yeah. Um, and so they did research afterwards as to which sponsors the, the people who attended remembered. And and the one that was remembered wasn't the multi-million pound uh, title sponsors. It was Southwest Airlines who provide cooled water chillers at every hole for spectators. So they mm. provided something that spectators wanted. And I think that's a really good example where a sponsor can add value yeah. you know, to an event in a, in a meaningful and engaging way with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the spectators. Yeah. 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 So it's adding, adding value, but also like, like we touched on briefly, having a, I suppose, a, a, a link sometimes between, I suppose, the, 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 maybe the moral ethics between the company and the, the event they're sponsoring. There does have to be a little bit of joined up thinking that actually they, the, the, the sponsor is a relevant sponsor for the event. Is that, that correct? Oh, yes. Uh, not only into, well, ethics is always a, a big starting point you know, for anybody because yeah. quite clearly, you know, there's the obvious legal ones that you can't be a drink, alcoholic drink sponsor and, you know, yeah. sponsor events aimed at under 25s. Uh, you know, you've then got the whole issue of sustainability and are they green? I mean, we've got the instance of British Cycling and Shell where that fell apart very badly for, yeah. for British Cycling. Um. But, but it's also, is it, uh, and you've got gambling, yeah. big, you know, big stories about are they appropriate, but you've got the more, you know, if you are doing a certain type of event, would certain types of sponsors not, would they, would they, um, gel, do they see, do the public gel with that sponsor and yeah. what they're doing or does it, you know, brand image and all that sort of thing and, and, and is it appropriate? Yeah. So I, I think delicate. one of the... Yeah, well, yeah, you, you've got to be sensitive to people's opinions. And, you know, I, I remember there was um, some research about a finance company that sponsored some art stuff. On, I think it was on television. You know, and the public thought, why? To which I totally agree. Yeah. Why are they doing it? They didn't show any link. To, you know, what they could have done is, is done something which they would do more these days about, you know, doing bursaries to help young artists or do, do something to show more of an engagement rather than the yeah. budget exercise. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I think I. So I, I get a sorry. I, ju, I ju, no, keep I've going, keep going. This. I'm really interested in this. Yeah. So I, 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 um, you know, I get approached for sponsorship. You name it, I've probably been approached on it. You know. So we, we, we did the sponsorship for the, um, the Emirates airline cable car. 
you know, when Boris came up with the idea of a cable car from, um, you know, at the time of the Olympics and various other things. So, you know, that's one of the more normal ones in certain senses. Yeah. Um, but the strangest request for sponsorship I ever had, which I have never forgotten, was for sponsorship for international submarine racing. Now, this was pre... <laughs> But this was pre yeah, underwater cameras or, or, or anything. I said, um, how is anybody going to know this is taking place and who is sponsoring it? Yeah. It, they wanted to sail a sub, submarines in a race across the Atlantic. So not a cheap exercise. Right. We never got into how much because I just said, well, how is a sponsor going to benefit from this? If you can't see them, you can't film them, not properly, right. you know, I just thought it 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 was it was so mad. I, in the sense, I quite like it, but I regard it more as I don't know. A, well, yeah, it, it was just it was the strangest request I've ever had. Yeah, have you seen sort of massive changes? Because of course, uh, previously, especially sporting events, um, you know, and especially things like I suppose darts and that, you know. Sponsorship was very much taken up by smoking companies, gambling companies, alcohol companies, and obviously that has reduced. Uh, well, mainly there was the, the ban on on you know smoking advertising. So, did that then maybe allow other companies to start getting involved and and go? Actually, this is something we could start filling that that space with, or, or was it always there? I think what happened was that you you've got various types of products. So you, for example, got food products that people like or don't like. You know, so mm. there's, I'll call it the Marmite effect in more senses than one. So you're not necessarily going to influence people through sponsorship um, in terms of brand and those things. You can influence through through product sampling or buying the product more regularly or things like that. But then you've got the service set by which I, I don't just mean insurance and pensions, but that's a good example. It could equally also be beer or um, car companies where yeah. the image is important in your purchasing decision. And it was those sorts of companies and still is to a degree where people, you know, started to grow and, and started to undertake sponsorship to create a identity. How do you choose one insurance company over another? Or yeah. a pension fund's even better because you have no idea which one's going to do better in 5, 10, 50 years' time than right. another. You're more likely to put your money with a company that you've heard of yeah. than one you've never heard of. So you're in the consideration list, if I can put it that way. Um, and also, if they do something that you quite like, you probably put them further, further higher up the list. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's the service sector particularly, those... There are big exceptions to that. So Formula One, for example, you know, uh, it's also about product trial, product usage. So a lot of IT companies, you know, are doing Formula One. So yeah. it does vary as to as to what people are doing. I mean, we're we're doing them, um, and it, we're working for a company called Orbex, and Orbex are going to be um, sending the first um, vertical rockets into space from the UK, from Scotland. Their spaceport will open in about six months' time, and the rockets will go up fairly soon after that. Um, it's it, 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 it's communication uh, satellites, small ones, which they're going to set up. So you've got the first rocket launch from UK soil. You know, yeah. it's vertical, not, not not the American ones, which Brands has put his name to on the back of an aircraft. It's, it's the real thing. <laughs> um, so they came to us and they said about, you know, do you think sponsorship? And yes, it could be about branding on rockets, but actually, I felt it. The thing was me. I thought I've never seen a rocket launch. I would have quite liked to have gone to Cape Canaveral, or go to those and see mm. a rocket launch. I think it should be something I'd be interested in doing. And I spoke, and quite a few. And you start. Yes, there's a sponsorship opportunity in here because why can't we, for example, um, you know, have uh, you and your guests, and, you know, prime positions to see takeoff go around the factory, see the rocket mm. being built, go around the spaceport, live stream for your workers, feel part of national pride. There's a whole raft of things. And, you know, that's a project we're working on at the moment. So I am curious because I I'm, I don't know much about the space industry, although I'm learning stuff as I go, but I'm never going to be a world expert on it. But it interests me. 
And yeah. that comes back to my curious thing. You know, there, there are certain projects that you think, oh, yeah, I quite like the sound of that. I'd like to know more. Um, and then you end up working for them. So you have to learn a lot more because what you have to do is you have to take something like, I'm going to put a rocket into space and make it relevant and believable to a sponsor. Yeah. And yes, you could put the name on the side and that may well be relevant. But why not bring your guests to see a rocket take off from you? Okay, so all those sorts of things are much more believable and meaningful and you can get hold of it. And think, yeah, well, I do sell a rather, I don't know, boring product. This would be a bit different to a ad in the trade stand or inviting them to a dinner or something else. And... And this is probably the most important thing in sponsorship is creating a memorable experience. So yeah. I'm there is a huge amount of research that, that says that sponsors who create a memorable experience will sell more products than those who just put a badging or don't do a sponsorship. So everybody has got their own things they always remember, whether it's seeing their football team win the FA Cup or win promotion or see a great band or there's a whole raft of things and most of them are relatable through sponsorship and yeah. if, if a brand can create a memorable experience you will remember that brand in a positive way and, and that influences bizarrely as it is your purchasing decisions yeah yeah so tell me about has there been a time when almost that curious side has not got you into trouble, but you've said yes to something and it hasn't quite gone to plan, apart from that early experience with the pool. And then how did you cope with that? How did you turn that around and what did you learn from it? Uh, well, the first thing to say is there, there are no guarantees on sponsorship. Nobody in there, nobody can guarantee that they can get a sponsor or you can pretty much get, you can guarantee to a degree how it will work because of media coverage or social media or whatever. Yeah. And so sponsorship should never be, you know, that, oh, I need that sponsorship to get this to happen. That is not a good business model no. at all. You know, um, so what you need to do is you need to say, can it add value to the spectator? Yes. Can I make some more money to invest in my ladies football team or my juniors or improving the pitch or whatever it might be? Yeah. Um, so, so I, I'm very selective who I, I, I take on. So I'll give you, and some things work and some things don't. It's not about the idea. It's actually about how you can get enough information out to people to get it to work. Okay. So if I talk about this photographic competition, which is getting launched uh, shortly, um, myself and, 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 and the client spent quite a bit of time just going through it and working it through. He knew what he wanted. I knew what this particular company probably wanted as a sponsorship asset. And we spent a lot of time getting the, the proposal and the deck ready. And we had somebody in mind to do it. And because we worked well together, we got the first company we went to, a major brand, because we spent time. This is not a quantity game. This is a quality game. If you really, and you can see a link and you can see why they want to do it and you spend the time doing it. Now, if clients aren't prepared to spend enough time with you doing that, and you think they are when they start, but they've got 50 million other things, it's never probably going to be as successful because you haven't really planned together the route to get this to work. Yeah. Um, and saying, oh, I want this, but not being prepared to put the time in is, yeah, we could do a lot, but we can't do everything without. We need to know the company's vision. We need to understand it and we need to get, you know, the sponsor and the sponsee to actually share that vision as a long-term strategic goal. And that requires a bit of time to do that. So what's, what's your vision then for, for your, yourself then? So you're obviously good at discovering a uh, client's vision. What, what's, uh, I suppose your, your mission or your vision, what, what really does, you know, you're curious, but what else gets you up in the morning? Well, I'm, um, I, I, yeah, I'm curious, but also the curiosity leads into how I, I've tried to, and I think successfully, to distinguish my, my consultancy from others. Because early on in the process, uh, I recognised there were a, you know two or three major sports sponsorship consultancies globally, Mark McCormick's IMG being the obvious one, but not the only one. 
who were prepared to put very large sums of money on the table to to secure exclusive sponsorship rights. So I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to be able to compete with them, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, so uh, that so the curiosity and the wit of what we do and my personality that I liked discovering new things in new areas all went together. So yeah. there, there was, yeah, I'm, I'm then, so if people want something that hasn't been done before, whether it's a cable car or, or, or whatever it might be, and I think it will work and I think we can work well together, then that really interests me because... You know, if you've got a sporting event, you know, you can go to quite a few people and I would argue are as good as, you know, anybody else. But, you know, if you go to something else like cable cars, there isn't anybody else with the experience. But, so, no. you know, you, and we know how to get it to work and we've been successful in it. So the, the, it all sort of blends together. Having to say that, you know, you know, if I had a 53rd cable car client i'd probably start to get a bit bored but you know there is the but i'll worry about that when i got 53rd one. yeah but it also depends if it's an interesting location yes yeah yeah i guess guess that helps so for um smaller companies so someone's maybe watching and uh, they're interested in some sponsorship and what you often see um on a small local level is sponsoring the local football team and often that is almost like a badging exercise isn't it you know they the you know the, the local builders merchants or the the plumber or whatever get, gets their name on a on a kid's sports team what value add do you think they could start to consider to go above and beyond that that actually might bring them a, a better return than just a, a pat on the back that they're they're feeling good about you know supporting a local team i think it all comes down to what industry you're in and what you're mm. trying to achieve i think there's a range of things an obvious example as to how it could work um, would be if you're a local car dealership. Because ultimately, the way you sell cars is test drives. So if you were to sponsor, yes, it could be a football team, but a football festival would potentially be better. Yeah. It could still be 7 to 11 year old with, I don't know, 50 teams or whatever. And, and, and part of the sponsorship would be that you want to be able to have some cars there and be able to do test drives. Yeah. It is totally proof. I've done it. I've bought cars when I've been to an event. And I've sat in it. I thought, oh, this is quite nice. And then if you want a test drive, and I've ended up buying it. I'm, and I'm I'm not a huge car fanatic. I like right. cars, but and but that works for many. So if you're a car company, you know, I think that's that that's a good example. I think if you're on the other hand a accountant or solicitor, it's you know when you need an accountant solicitor, who do you go to? It's somebody you've heard of. Yeah, you know, you're much more likely to go to somebody you've heard of. Oh. What was the name of that company on that on that football shirt or whatever? Yeah. So it all depends what your objectives are. So going into a completely different area, but it's related just to explain that point further. So they're big sponsorships, but I think they're quite useful for people to understand because they go beyond branding. Yeah. So O2 Arena. Why do O2 sponsor the O2 Arena at Greenwich? So Pre um, them sponsoring that, there was no loyalty or pretty low loyalty by mobile phone companies. You finish your contract with Vodafone and you went to somebody else and whatever. Yeah. So, yes, O2 get a lot of branding on the O2 arena. However, that is not the reason they do it at all. The reason they do it is the O2 rewards program. So, if you are an O2 customer, 48 hours before tickets go on sale to the general public, you will have the opportunity to buy those same tickets ahead of everybody else and get ahead of the queue. That So this is all about retaining customers. Yeah, the value add. They've Another, discovered the value add, haven't they? Yeah, exactly. That's got nothing to do with, with branding. Branding no. is a minimal part. They wouldn't do it just for branding. Another example is we, we we did sponsorship for the closure of the old Wembley Stadium. And I'm not sure anybody else has done building closure sponsorship, but anyhow. And we we, 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 we got a couple of things. What, what, which I think is quite interesting is we got a Procter & Gamble hair shampoo brand to become a sponsor. And in return, they had the benches from the England dressing room to use as an on-pack promotional prize. So you could win the venture in the England dressing. Bizarrely, I had Procter & Gamble Athens office phone me three months later and said, do you know that promotion you did? 
And I said, yes. Um, you know, could we do the same thing? And I had to explain there was only one dressing room bench <laughs> and that we couldn't suddenly magic one out of anywhere else. Anyhow, yeah. Um, yeah. But but the other one, one of the others we did is we, we did a, an arrangement with Snickers. And if you sent in six proofs of purchase of Snickers bars, so that it's a you know, loyalty program, yep. you got a free piece of turf from Wem- Wembley Stadium with certificate of authenticity. The hardest thing in that was making sure the grass was still green when it arrived. Yeah. But... <laughs> But but the key point is that got, neither of those had anything to do with none of those had anything to do with branding. It nice. was thinking through, you know, what Snickers, uh, you know, the brand wanted people to buy their bars more regularly. Yeah, and they, you didn't charge them, but if you did, and you you get a bit of Wembley turf and a certificate. I'm, I keep on wondering how many of those certificates are still alive, uh, still around. I'm not sure that any turf will <laughs> no. be, but it'd be quite curious. <laughs> Yeah, so it is, but he didn't cost any. But. No, so actually, yeah, I think lots of people think of sponsorship as a as a branding exercise of sticking a badge on something. But actually, every company, even the small ones, need to think slightly bigger. And actually, what value do I add to participants or uh, you know visitors to whatever it is, whatever it is that's being sponsored, and actually see where they can add value, and that's what will drive additional sales, additional income. Uh, increase awareness, et cetera. You're actually right. I, and, and and there's other things it can do as well. So we've talked mainly about marketing benefits, as you say, increase sales if they, yeah. or trial or whatever. But he equally can deliver HR benefits. So, for example, mm. if you were a let's, – let's take an example, something I'm talking to some people about at the moment. There is a 20 – well, actually, I'll do a better example, STEM. I can't get enough engineers. I can't get high IT people, whatever. You know, sponsorship has quite often been used as a way to aid in cr- recruitment into a industry or a, or a sector like engineering or IT, yeah. but equally to think about who am I going, if you've gone into that, who am I going to work for? Am I going to go and work for X, Y, or Z? Yeah. Um, so HR is another reason. So if you are a major employer... Uh, in the engineering sector for sake of we we did a deal with GE Oil and Gas. So GE Oil and Gas became the sponsor of the Aberdeen Arena. Very bizarre. Very bizarre. If you saw it, why is this oil and gas company? The reason they did it is that Maersk, were, were the Norwegian oil company, were advertising on television for engineers. We took uh, GE Oil and Gas at a much lower cost into sponsoring the arena. One, because it, it it raised awareness in the area and with engineering companies. Yep. But equally, if the engineers came along to work for GE, they knew that they were going to be able to get tickets to the, see their favourite concerts. Yeah. So there was an employee benefit as well as an awareness one. Um, and it worked very well. Yeah. And actually, but not, I, I... it wouldn't be obvious to most people. No. No, and actually recruitment and, and HR and, and keeping people at the moment is is incredibly hard. You know, I've spoken to lots of uh, employment agencies and, and actually it's a it's tough to, to keep and retain the right people. And it's more than just about the, the money that they're being paid. Actually, it's not just about a salary. People want to work for a company that they've got a bit of belief in. And actually the, the sponsorship side can really add value to the employees. You've got it in one. You're yeah. actually right, you know, because you've got to do it right. This is why if you become a sponsor, you need to think through what your objectives, how you can get it. Well, you need to spend some time on it. Yeah. And what can you do? You know, I I, I still get a few people who come along and they say, yeah, um, we'd like to sponsor something. Well, who's your target market? Everyone. No, no, no. You can't <laughs> reach everyone. Right. We've got to be a bit more, you know, go into a bit more detail than that yeah. um and you know and what are you trying to actually achieve it could be to change the image of your company or your brand yeah it could be to get more recruits it could be to um sample products there's a whole raft of reasons why people can do things um you know and 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 you, and you need to relate them all through because ultimately ultimately it's using your it's using people's leisure leisure and social interests, and that social interest could be you know um, 
poor children in Africa or, or, or you know, whatever it might be, a social cause, as a way to engage and be, you know, to get a, a meaningful emotional relationship with the consumer. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's really opened my eyes to actually what sponsorship is and and the benefits it can it can bring. I've I've really enjoyed learning about that today. What I want to ask you just to finish off today is obviously you've you've grown this business for many years now. For someone looking to start a business, regardless of what sector that would be, and I often finish with this question: What advice would you give to someone looking to start a business? Avoid passion taking over common sense. Okay. I have met lots of people who want to get into sport. So I'll give you an example. You know, if I get a letter from somebody who says, oh, I'm passionate about sport, I've done this, I've done the other, et cetera, et cetera, I want to go to work. And we do do a lot of sport. You know, that isn't necessarily, you know, the, 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 the key factor that I really want to hear. I would much prefer them to say, I'm doing marketing and I'm interested in all sorts of other things. So, I, 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 you know, a passion for sport is not a reason to go into sport. No, it I might can't... make it enjoyable. But so, so I think that's important. Um, and it, 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 it's ultimately, I think, about enjoying yourself and managing risk. You know, managing risk is very mm. important. You shouldn't be afraid of trying something new, providing the upside is very good and the risk is not high. And I think that's it. That's it. And, and have a sensible business plan and talk to friends about it and you know, talk, talk to a few people and make sure that, you know, you're not being stupid at the end of the day. And ultimately, the most important thing is being self-motivated. You've got to get out of bed in the morning. You've got to, you know, have meetings, get on the court or whatever. Um, I have no problem because I love what I do. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Yeah, you've got, got to have, it's more than just just having the passion. You've actually got to believe in it and actually, like you say, have that motivation or determination to to keep going and understanding that you know, you will have to take some risks and just having a look at, I guess, balancing those risks and, and ensuring yeah. that actually it's not going to trip you up too, too much. But, yeah, well, it's a bit like I, I, when I first started, um, I, I, I got invited to speak at conferences and I was petrified. The whole idea of public speaking was terrible as far as I was concerned. Um, but I, I, I still got myself to do it because I knew I had to. But over a period of time, I started to realise that actually, if you understand what you're, what you're talking about, you know, then you should just feel comfortable in your own knowledge and ability and not feel nervous about it. Um, and I think that's it, it, it's the same process with all these sorts of things at the end of the day. You need to be able to, you know, I, I, I wrote the first ever um, uh, management report on sponsorship for the Financial Times many years ago. And they, they came to me and said, will you write? The, I've, I've never written a management <laughs> report in my life. I have no <laughs> idea. But at the end of it, looking back on it, I thought, actually, it wasn't bad. It was OK. Yeah. You know, and the conference speaking, all this sort of thing. You've, you've got to have sensible levels of confidence and learn as you go. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Le learn as you go, sensible levels of confidence. I, I completely agree with those. Richard, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I've learned a lot about sponsorship and I hope everyone listening and watching has, has too. So yeah, thank you once again. Pleasure. Nice to meet. Bye. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Balance Ambition Podcast. I genuinely hope the stories inspire you as much as they inspire me. If you found value in today's conversation, please share it with a friend. And remember, by subscribing, you won't miss an episode and it would truly mean the world to me. Stay balanced and I'll see you next time.